Last night at the fireplace reading, you were talking about all the work you've done in salmon restoration and not realizing or not um, being aware of the global climate change impacts. So can you talk to us a little bit today about watershed health and global climate change? It, uh, I realized coming over here when you had asked me before what I wanted to talk about today that it really didn't matter. And my answers are going to be the same to almost any question you ask me. Um, we, it's not that we worked for 25 years without uh, knowing about climate change. Everybody knew about it. Uh, it wasn't unfrequent to, uh, for any one of us to poo-poo the people who were uh, denying uh, human-caused uh, climate change. Uh, what struck me recently was simply that in all the literally dozens and perhaps hundreds of strategic planning sessions that went on during that period, uh, climate change never became um, a part of that. It never became, became one of the factors that uh, we, uh, we challenged ourselves to deal with. And as I think about it further, I realize that there's really no way to do that because uh, the effects of climate change are so entirely unpredictable. Uh, we are more than ever in a situation that we have to improvise our way through. It's uh, the biggest human challenge uh, that humans have always faced. Uh, it's perhaps another definition of evolution. Uh, the people who improvise well uh, uh, prevail. What being involved in something like watershed restoration, which is another way of saying involving yourself deeply in a place, is that you put yourself in a optimal learning situation. Um, if you want to learn about nature, you put yourself in nature and put yourself in the way of information that nature has to offer. If you're working in a community-based restoration, communi uh, restoration culture, you put yourself in the way of learning about community and how that functions and how to become a functional part of it. Um, if you want to learn about how information grows and accrues, you put yourself next to other people and share your information and they share yours with you and you learn how that works. You learn how a, a tribally held body of information accrues and how effective that is. Uh, what over time I think I have uh, learned from that is a dim understanding of how oral culture worked for so many thousands of years. Uh, it was simply people sharing information and remembering that information. So I have only, uh, it's because I have recently uh, kind of stepped aside from a, from a serious involvement, from a leadership involvement in uh, watershed restoration in, in, in my community, mainly because I got too old to stay wet all the time and move big rocks around, uh, that I, I began to take the time to look around and look at what I, gave my, what I allowed myself to call externalities for 25 years, which are basically all the things that happen outside my watershed. Uh, it doesn't mean I was unaware of them. It means I chose to put my efforts where I thought they would do the most good. And uh, those things were happening. Uh, and the, the efforts that I was involved in were relating to them in their own small way. There were 10,000 other groups uh, working uh, along similar paths that were affecting uh, things in the same way I had and continue to have absolute faith that all those things will take us to a different place. I don't know what that place is. I don't think anyone does. I don't want anyone to tell me there's a specific place they want to, 
uh, they want us to take ourselves. Um, I do know that the joy I get from my relationships to food and knowing that my sustenance comes from the beauty I'm seeing around me, quite literally, not in terms of aesthetics, but in terms of food and comfort and joy. Um, I can't think of a, uh, a more rewarding way to, uh, to carry on my life, either uh, intellectually or um, otherwise. So if you find those, um, those things so important to the sustenance, um, there's been a lot of discussion these last couple of days about people's disconnect. So what can we do as um, practitioners to reconnect our youth, our uh, colleagues, to that spiritual aspect of the watershed? Well, we pretend that uh, we're doing things to, healing the water sh to heal the watershed. Uh, the watersheds are actually healing us. Uh, that's the way that that works. I don't. I don't really know if I've answered your question, but this seems very simple to me. I wonder how many people realize that they're being healed when they, that if they have a relationship with nature, um, or, or even take the time to have that relationship. So how can we? as a society, get more people engaged? Well, that's two questions, I think. Uh, how do people know and how do we get more people involved? Uh, I think people, uh, I'm sure that people know because they come back again. Um, uh, we will engage more people uh, by demonstrating by example. Uh, the Uh, the pleasure that we take and the works that we do, and the pleasure is returned to us. Uh, my friend Jim Dodge once said, uh, there's a, a nothing better than singing for your supper when you actually get supper. Uh, Water said uh, restoration, um, attentiveness to, uh, to the place that you live, delivers, it just delivers and uh, other people see that. And there's nothing, there's no way you can talk to them about it or try to convince them of it. It's more convincing than simply living your life the way you live it. Mm -hmm. And having the experience itself. Yeah. So do you, do you think that the concept of watershed health will become more important in the, in the future? I don't think it matters if we use that particular description. Uh, I think it's going to become more important and more clear that uh, humans are part of ecological systems and human health and ecological health are totally intertwined, interpenetrated. And uh, the unfortunate, uh, one of the unfortunate things about that is that that's going, that those that situation is going to be forced on us. Um, I think that's the importance of global warming, the, of climate change, is that we will no longer have the luxury, as I said last night, of thinking about e ecology as an abstract system. We're going to become ecology. Because just our lifestyles will be so affected by the changes. So you think that will... Um bring people to an understanding that they are a part of the system? We'll change or die. Um, the changes that are necessary to make are to become part of the system. And it's uh, in, the, in the near future, by which I mean maybe a few hundred years, uh, it's going to be a rapidly changing system. You know, the system, I should say. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to practitioners or teachers of uh, environmental curriculum? 
what what would you tell them to instill instill in their students? The most valuable for, thing for me, and um, this could simply be because I was so stupid in this um, in the subject when I started, has been a sense of environmental history. How uh, natural succession has been the most, uh, very most exciting thing for me to learn about. To sit still for 28 years in one place and watch it happen has been um, one of the wonders of my life. Uh, people ask me what in the world I do, isolated out of the country, I tell them I watch trees grow. They think I'm joking, I'm not. Um, and, and environmental uh, history is, uh, is a very important thing to know. History in general is a very important thing to know. Americans are very deficient in, in history, I think, in general. Uh, we tend to think that um, the way things now are the way things always have been and always will be. Uh, I think what I was trying to point out last night that we have sometimes made, their, made the mistake of thinking that the ecosystems within which we live are the way they are the way they always have been and always will be. Um, my research in environmental history has really been shocking to me that way. It's been a shock to my psychic system that these wonderful forests, as old as they are, are still no older than 5,000 years, and perhaps 5,000 years they were not even, they were not here at all, an entirely different forest was here or entirely different uh, type of, of, of vegetated community. Um, could have been grasslands. Mm -hmm. So, because we're such a mobile culture um, and a global society, how are how is that knowledge transferred? If a person comes into a community? That's a good question. Um, often, um, I, mean, I, I have been talking about bioregional uh, ideas as a lens of perception for about 30 years. And people often interpret that to mean that they have to stay in one place for the rest of their lives because that's what they will have learned about. Uh, what I have found, on, on the contrary, is that once you learn how to learn the way that a system works, that is transferable knowledge. If you find yourself in another system, you're going to find it easier the second time to learn how that system works. You're going to also know how important it is to make that one of your first objectives. And so, who do you go to to learn that? Do you go to the land? Or do you go to the elders? If there are elders available, uh, you're in luck. Uh, if they're not available, you're not necessarily out of luck. Uh, you still have uh, your neighbors who maybe have been there longer than you have. Uh, if you ever have them, you have nature itself. Uh, go out in the woods and sit down for a few years and you learn what there is to know. Great. So what is, um, so you have had the benefit of being in a place for 25, 30 years in, mm -hmm. in one place and, uh, and learn that system. Um, what are you doing to share that with the newcomers to your rally? Uh, we do that kind of systematically. Um, as long as we've been in operation, we've sent our, well, we sent a newsletter and, uh, and copies of, uh, of uh, research papers that we've done to every landowner and uh, resident, resident in the watershed. Uh, when land sells, for instance, uh, the seller is going to have a pile of Metal Restoration Council newsletters and perhaps maps of old growth and maps, 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 uh, that they may very well show the buyer. Uh, the buyer may very well write one of our groups and say, I'm buying this place on such and such, I would like to maintain it in a, um, in a healthy way. I would even maybe like to engage in some restoration activities on that. How do I go about that? Mm -hmm. 
So you really reach out to the newcomers yeah. to invite them. That's great. And, uh, yeah, and there's another way that, uh, that works. Uh, because if we, I live in a, a very remote place, uh, once kids get out of high school, they tend to drift away. There are not a lot of academic opportunities. Um, the restoration work itself draws people of exactly that age group into the valley. So um, there's a lot of uh, exchange, a lot of cross-fertilization. Uh, these newcomers come out of, well, usually come right out of good colleges and bring us the latest information. Mm -hmm. And we have the, uh, the inspiration of their, 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 what would otherwise be a missing generation. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So um, people often bemoan the loss of industrial, uh, either agricultural or logging communities. Do you think that um, they can be replaced with a restoration economy? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, in the early days of restoration, we used to say that uh, our ultimate goal is to work ourselves out of a job. Um, it's only after working, after doing this for 25 years that I realized that we probably aren't going to work ourselves out of our job and out of a job in our generation or uh, even the next. But unless we involve ourselves in the creation of uh, other economic opportunities, having to do with the same things we're dealing with, the soils, the grasses, the trees, uh, we will be building a system where we will become some kind of uh, professional mitigators that uh, clean up messes after other people. Uh, so we also need to be involving ourselves in the creation of uh, economic uh, systems that don't do as much damage as the previous uh, uh, systems have done. And more often than not, that involves a matter of scale. Uh, in uh, uh, logging, for instance, uh, there's a lot of work being done in our watershed to, as the big corporate entities uh, fail and pull out and take their capital elsewhere, um, to decentralize that, those operations and create opportunities in, uh, in timber and secondary product production uh, for local people living in the watershed. Um, that's hard work. It takes, it, it takes capital. It's, it's uh, a mystery where to mm -hmm. find the capital sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it's a system that might be sustainable yes. to, to support your, your communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great.